Hello, and welcome to the Royal Road School of Carmelite Prayer. A link to the Praying with Teresa of Avila website has been provided below to enable you to find the catalog of offerings on this channel and the notes and PowerPoint of today's presentation, Episodes in the Life of Teresa of Avila. Session 1. Through the teenage years. The 28th of March in 1515 in Avila, a cold, snow covered morning in the city of 2,000 parapets, there's a big house close to the southern wall, a house built of granite. Above the door, there is a stone coat of arms, stripes and circles, crossed spades, and rampant lions. It's the house of El. Alonso Sanchez de Cepeda and Mrs. Beatriz de Ahumada. It's a noble Castilian home with many large spacious rooms adorned with knight spurs, crossbows, leather, and wooden shields, golden sashes, and glittering war helmets. There are Dutch sheets, long shirts of gold, tunics from Valencia, and coats of mail from Damascus. On the shelves are books on history and literature, devotional books, lives of saints, the works of Cicero and of Seneca, poetry of Virgil, the Gospels, and on the table there is a chess set with ivory figures, gold crosses, and silver chains and blessed candles. Alonso and Beatrice together with five children and some relatives, are celebrating. A baby girl has been born. A few days later, the 4th of April, the bells are pealing on St. John's Church, and a group of people are making their way towards the parish church. Francisco Nunez Vela, dressed as a knight with cape and sword, and Mrs. Maria de Aguila, daughter of the governor of the city, are leading the group. They are carrying the daughter of Alonso Sanchez de Cepeda, wrapped in white laced garments. She is going to be baptized. Next to the font, in that wide open nave, the name of Teresa is publicly declared for the first time. When the joyful procession leaves the church and heads back to the palace of Francisco Nunez, the soft sound of a convent bell is heard. The convent of the Incarnation is being inaugurated, the one that will be the future home of this baby, founded inside the town's walls in 1478. As a Carmelite convent, it was moved outside the town, being built on land that had previously been a Jewish cemetery. On this very day, the date on which the saint was baptized, the unfinished monastery was opened with four naves enclosing a central courtyard and a cloister with two levels. Teresa will immortalize it. The small bell was already calling her, greeting her from its high bricked tower. Teresa's mother, Donna Beatriz Davila Ahamada y de la de las Cuevas, known as Beatriz de Ahumada, was from a rich and illustrious Castilian family. She was her husband's second wife, was 17 years old when they married on May 14, 1509, in Gatarandura, where her family owned a grand palace. She was born in 1492, was 21 years younger than her husband, Beatrice was 23 when her third child, her first girl, was born. She named the baby Teresa after her own mother. Donna Beatrice and Alonso de Cepeda had 10 children. Hernando, Rodrigo, Teresa, Juan de Ahumada, Lorenzo, Antonio, Pedro, Geronimo, Augustin, and Juana. She was a loving mother, a devout Catholic, who raised her children in the faith. Beatrice died in 1528 
After 19 years of marriage, Teresa's father, Alonso Sanchez de Cepeda, was a successful wool merchant and one of the wealthiest men in Avila, a prosperous city and district. He was born there and baptized on February the 10th, 1471. He died there at the age of 72 in December 1543. He married twice, first in Avila with Donna Cantalina del Pezzo and Hanano. They had three children before she died, Juan, Maria, and Pedro. Later he married Beatrice, a distant cousin of Catalina. Alonso, a devout, observant, and strict Catholic, had bought a knighthood through a lawsuit of nobility and was a very successful man of business who lived an honorable life in Spanish high society. Alonso's father was Jewish. His name was Juan Sanchez. He was a Jewish convert merchant living in Toledo who was condemned by the Inquisition in 1485 for having apostatized and Judaized. Many of Spain's Jews converted to Christianity because of the pogroms in 1391. To make sure that these conversos were true to their new faith, the Spanish Inquisition was established in 1478. All openly practicing Jews were expelled from Spain in 1492. However, many remaining practicing Jews chose to become conversos rather than face exile. Conversos who did not fully or genuinely embrace Catholicism but continued to practice their faith in secrecy were called Judaizers. Teresa's grandfather, her father's father, On the 22nd day of the month of June in the year 1485, gave, presented, and swore to a confession before the then Lord Inquisitors in which he said and confessed that he had done and committed many serious crimes and offenses of heresy and apostasy against our holy Catholic faith. Juan Sanchez was later able to assume a Catholic identity but only after taking part in a degrading ceremony. Teresa's grandfather, in procession with other reconciled ones, walked through the streets of Toledo from church to church, facing public ridicule for seven Fridays in succession. While on this march of shame, jeered and mocked by the crowds who came to see, Juan Sanchez and the others were forced to wear the San Benetilo, the strange garment of humiliation showing that they were tried and condemned by the acquisition. The San Benetilo was a penitential garment that for penitent heretics either featured yellow or X or red X shaped crosses whose wearer was only to do penance. Ironically, it looks like the scapula This took place when Alonso, Teresa's father, was four years old. How the memory of it must have been burned into his brain, seeing or hearing about the treatment of his father. How the shame, the disgrace, must have haunted Alonso. How great a part this played in developing his scrupulous approach to religion, to religious matters. No one knows how great a part this experience played in the upbringing of Teresa. We can only speculate. Now the wealthy noble, devout Alonso Sanchez de Cepeda and his illustrious wife, Mrs. Beatriz de Ahumada, are prosperous, established pillars of society, living an honorable life, intent on raising honorable Catholic children. Teresa is seven years old. The rooms in their big house are lit by oil lamps so that Mr. Alonso can go over his daily accounts and Mrs. Beatrice can see to sew. Teresa and her brother Rodrigo are reading the yellowed pages of a book about the lives of saints. The first is an 
anchorite, a Hmong, who lives in solitude for many years with wild animals who serve him. Then there is a virgin with a very innocent expression and a white genuine garment which makes her seemingly float above the ground. Then there is a martyr, a tyrant, condemns him for his confessing his faith in Christ. Some executioners cut his head off, and he flies straight to heaven, surrounded by angels, palms, and crowns. Teresa's eyes glow with enthusiasm. Glory forever and ever and ever. The children repeat this over and over and absorb, are absorbed in thinking about it. The next day, neither Teresa nor Rodrigo are found in the house. They look for them in the garden, in the palace of their godfather, Nunez Vela, who lives so close, and they look in the streets of the city. All their efforts seem useless. The children cannot be found anywhere. There is a very uneasy feeling in the house, as the parents are terribly worried about the whereabouts of the two children. Maybe they left the city while playing and they got lost. Maybe some house servant or some vagrant. After several hours of anxiety, the brother of Mr. Alonso, Francisco de Cepeda, knocks at the door. He has arrived on his horse, carrying Teresa in front and Rodrigo behind him. He found them far from the city walls, towards the northeast, past the bridge which crosses the river Ajeda, and close to a monument of four granite columns. According to them, they were on journey to the land of the Moors so that they would be decapitated by them as martyrs and go straight to heaven like them in the midst of the angels, crowns, and canticles. They both returned sadly. Their uncle made their fabulous dream wither away so close, as the children thought, and to the land of the Moors, where the martyrs gained their glory at the easy price of martyrdom. But Teresa isn't discouraged. One dream withers away, and another crops up much stronger. If they can't be martyrs, they'll be hermits, like those of which they had read in the lives of the saints. And so they put themselves to work, every day holding hands firmly. Terry and Rod go out to the garden of stone walls behind their house, and they play. They play in the midst of songs and dust. Rodrigo looks uh, through the garden for small rocks, odd pieces of brick, and he takes them to Teresa, who, sitting on the ground, tries hard to construct some walls trying to give them windows. It's a hermitage. They're playing hermits. They recite their devotions, their readings. They have their prayer time with their small hands together on their chests and their eyes looking towards heaven. And they start to dream if the little animals would come to rest humbly before them as they read in the lives of the hermit with great enthusiasm. The next day they go again to the garden to continue their practices next to their little hermitage. But what a shame. A wind had blown during the night and pushed the mud and rocks to the ground. It has collapsed. The two children look silently and disappointedly at the ruins of the small house they had made the day before. Teresa is 13 years old. In these years, Spain was full of a desire for adventure and conquest, particularly in Avila, land of castles, knights, and crusaders. Through its streets, the sound of spurs and swords of warriors heading to Flanders or to the recently discovered America could be heard continuously, and the popular literature reflects this. In the evenings, in the palaces and the noble houses, alternating with books of piety, they read stories of the history of battles, stories of fantastic adventures, and narration of heroic deeds of the knights. 
In the Cepeda house, Mrs. Beatrice enjoys reading them and looks at them as an innocent entertainment and a distraction from her worries. One day, those books fall into the hands of Teresa and Rodrigo. They come with pictures on plates of battles, of walking knights, of gallants, and of ladies finely dressed and perfumed. Teresa gets dazzled by it all. It seems so attractive to be able to give a pleasant appearance and to feel loved by others like those fiction ladies. And she starts to imitate them. She no longer goes to the garden to play with Rodrigo, the hermit game. She no longer looks to heaven, repeating forever and ever and ever. She likes to look at herself in the mirror, to take care of her hair, curls, to pamper her fine hands, to put perfume on. If before she dreamed about being a hermit or about dying for Christ in the hands of the Moors, now she is concerned about being looked at and admired by the dressy gallants when they pass below the entrance gates of Alcazar. And at home she no longer talks about the martyrdoms or of the life of penitence. Now her discourse is on hobbies, dressing up in gallants. A young and worldly relative of hers begins initiating her in the most frivolous feminine ways. They pass a lot of time together chatting and whispering behind the back of her mother, who isn't happy with the friendships of her daughter. Teresa finds herself in a world of ideas, desires, and fantasies, very different from those of her first years. Her cousins have led her there by the hand, but it's not only her young relative that has made Teresa interest herself in that brilliant world of lights, fashions, and perfumes. It has also been a son of her uncle, Mr. Francisco de Cepeda. The house in which he lives is so close that there is only a wall between them, and the wall has a small door that opens up to a passageway between the two houses. So they go from one house to the other whenever they please. They play and make jokes together in the garden and in the living rooms. The cousin doesn't separate himself from Teresa, so intelligent and pleasant to be with, who knows how to give life to their conversation and games. And so there comes a day in which the friendship of the cousin grows into something more. Teresa is full of charm, life, and elegance. They talk alone in the shadows of the family room, dimly lit by the oil lamp, and perhaps they even planned for later on. Their happy matrimonial union at the foot of the altar of the parish church. Mrs. Beatrice de Ahumada passed away in the last few days of 1528. She was 36 years old and the mother of 10 children. When this sad news reaches the Cepeda house from Gatarandra, the small town in which she had died on the northwest of Avila, 14 miles from the city, it produces a painful shock in the household. Teresa cries inconsolably while embracing her older brothers, who unsuccessfully try to stay strong before this terrible blow. It's the first strong pain that visits them, and they all grieve profoundly. They have lost their mother, still young and beautiful, so good, so affectionate. The next day, a funeral procession slowly advances from Gadarendra towards Avila. A heavy heart cart carries the coffin with the body of Mrs. Beatrice de Ahumada. Behind them, right next to the bodily remains of his wife, Mr. Alonso follows, sad and downcast, but serene. On each side, there are relatives, friends, and household servants who pray in silence for the deceased. The procession advances along 
difficult, winding roads, some going up, others going down. They travel on the snow, which covers all the rough land full of peaked rocks like a shroud. And they finally arrive at Avila in silence. They cross the Roman bridge over the river, and they enter the western entrance of the city wall. When Teresa and her brothers see the funeral procession while peeking from the windows, they see the coffin in which their mother is being carried, and they break out into tears and sobs as a sad farewell of the children to their good mother who leaves them forever. A little while later, Teresa leaves the house alone, silently crossing the street to go to the western part of the city. She goes down through the suburbs of the Jews, crying. She goes out through the city wall and enters into the chapel of St. Lawrence on the right side of the river. She prostrates herself at the foot of the statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary, Our Lady of Grace. Before her, sobbing and weeping, she pours out all the pain of her broken heart. She feels as though she had a great weight on her chest. Everything seems gloomy for her with her dead mother. It was as though they had buried her enthusiasm and her joy of living. Her heart feels empty and broken, as though it had a big hollow in it, wide and profound, as a pit left by a tree, torn out, roots and all. And she asks Our Lady to help and comfort her. She alone can make the torn flower, the, make the flowers and the lilies on the road of her life flourish again. Now that she offers herself to her, feeling so tired, sad, and wearisome. Teresa grows in grace and beauty as well as in age, 15, 16, 17 years old. The days and months have passed by have dimmed the pain of losing her mother, and Mr. Alonso's lovely daughter keeps in contact with her cousin. She keeps taking care of her gentle hands, perfuming her hair and dresses, walking through the streets and plazas with her beauty and elegance, provoking admiration and affection towards her wherever she goes. Her father pays careful attention to the sort of friendships that his daughter has and is not pleased with the relationship with the young relative that visits their home. He advises Teresa against those long conversations with her cousin. Teresa responds with silence. Her father must warn her again, but it's worthless. Mr. Alonso decides to break once and for all the occasion and the danger. It's the 13th of July, 1531. At the Cepeda home, there are emotional farewells and goodbye kisses. Teresa leaves with Mr. Alonso. They walk walk the short distance to a poor convent of nuns, the Augustinians of Grace. Mr. Alonso wants Teresa to go there as a border student, isolated from the outside without any visits of friends or correspondence with relatives, and above all, from that cousin who loves her and pursues her. Mr. Alonso says goodbye to his daughter, who is left inside the convent, and the door closes behind her. The noble Castilian gentleman, with a firm and steady pace, climbs the small incline next to the city wall and slowly returns to the family home. The convent of Our Lady of Grace, run by the cloistered Augustinian nuns, had been founded in 1508 and was known for its austerity and observance. In this, it was quite unlike the German houses um, of that order, which were being impacted at the very time by the teachings of another Augustinian, Friar Martin Luther. 
Teresa was sad at first in her new life as an internal boarder, but bit by bit starts to change her, uh, her attitude and even gets to be happy in the nun's college. The joy in life of the other young boarders, the classes, the new order for each hour of the day make the nostalgia of the family home fade away. The cousin tries hard to communicate by sending messages, letters through the turn, but these don't always reach Teresa. With the passing of time and with new experience, the memory of him and those other dreams dim away. One day, Mary Brisino, mistress of the young border girls, talks to them about the calling to life in the cloister. This Augustinian nun used to receive Holy Communion every morning, a great rarity in those days. She would go to some other church at great inconvenience if there happened to be no Mass in the convent. One Holy Thursday, when she had been unable to receive and the host was already reserved in the tabernacle for Good Friday. She wept in great dejection. After some minutes, she saw two hands approaching her, holding the sacred host, which was placed on her tongue. So St. Thomas of Villanova reported, adding that she had not volunteered the information, but told him, when ordered to do so, under her vow of obedience. It is, in, it is recorded also in the annals of the convent that shortly after Teresa went to board there, a light appeared in the presence of all in the community and took the form of a star, which after floating around the choir, paused over Sister Maria and then disappeared into her heart. Sister Maria was a Castilian lady to her fingertips from one of the illustrious families of Avila and so evidently capable of enjoying life that Teresa wondered how she ever renounced the world and all its diversions for an existence of hard work and penance. One day, Sister Maria explained, telling the story of how she herself felt God's calling it came after an incidental reading she had made. Her eyes fell on a book with the following gospel passage. Many are called, few are chosen. And this was the beam of light she needed to make her realize the vanity of life and the dangers of the world. It had not occurred to the young Teresa that nuns do not choose to be nuns, but are chosen by Christ for that particular life. They are free to accept or refuse. If they accept, they must literally give up everything, wealth, friends, liberty, everything that is most dear to the people of the world. Christ had made it easy for those who loved him to do this by giving the example, and those who took him at his word discovered presently something of the divine paradox of Christianity. They saw that whereas the people of the world who sought their own gratification had the discontented and unhappy faces of those who had not found what they sought, the others who had asked nothing had received a positive and radiant joy which sustained them even in poverty and pain and was unlike anything that the flesh pots of the world could offer, to say nothing of the perfect and everlasting joy of the next world, which was promised to those who followed Christ. Teresa, who follows attentively the vocation story, feels as though the ideals and the interest of her childhood had been lying dormant within her were now being reborn with the good readings and spiritual talks. But she hadn't yet discovered her religious vocation. 
she was a declared enemy of the idea of being a nun. For reflection and discussion, why do you think Teresa wanted to be a Christian martyr as a child? Did her beauty make her self-conscious? In what way? How did her family assist Teresa's spiritual development? How did Sister Maria assist her spiritually? What insight did Teresa receive about vocations? Did Teresa's father do the right thing by making her become a boarder at a convent? Do you think if you had a teenage daughter who behaved as Teresa did, that you would send her to a convent? And of session one.